So thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, my name is J.F. Garrard and I'm the Litter Asian Toronto Festival Coordinator, a senior editor for Rice Paper Magazine and president of Dark Healer Express. And today is November 1st, the day after Halloween. And so instead of eating candy and watching Netflix, you're all here. So thank you very much for making history and being present at the first ever uh, Litter Asian Toronto event. So thank you very much. Litter <laughs> So Litter Asian is an annual festival that was founded by the late Jim Wong Chu and the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, ACWW, in Vancouver, BC, with the purpose of promoting and celebrating works of Asian Canadian writers and artists through author readings, panel discussions, and workshop events. So I first heard of Litter Asian when I was invited to speak at one in Vancouver in 2015 by Jim Wong Chu. And I remember asking one of the organizers, why me? I had just self-published a book on East meets West vampires, and I was really a nobody in the world of literature. Instead of answering my question, they asked me, who else in Canada writes such books and can teach others about self-publishing? So I went to Litter Asian Vancouver, and now I'm running one in Toronto. And I'll be forever grateful to Jim for including me in this amazing event that's so inclusive of everyone, no matter what level of um, writing they're at. And I think he would be proud of how it's grown over the years. So Litter Asian Toronto is made possible by general sponsors such as the Canadian Council for the Arts and different departments at the University of Toronto, University College, the Asian Canadian Studies Department, the Richard Charles Lee Lab Chair in Chinese Canadian Studies, the English Department, and the Cheng Yu Ting East Asian Library. I would also like to thank all the staff members of Litter Asian Toronto, uh, the committee that helped make this possible, including Tana, Tanya aguila -Wei, Meryl Kambu Relly, Hannah Kim, Lisa Marr, Caitlin Morishita Miki for making this event happen. So before we start the first panel, we have a few opening remarks from Hannah and from Dr. Uh, Lisa Marr. <coughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Good afternoon. My name is Hannah Kim. I'm the director of the Chinese Institution Library. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land. On behalf of the Changita Institution Library, um, I'd like to welcome you all to the Leader Asian in Toronto event. Thank you for joining us on this very special occasion. We are thrilled to host the first Asian Canadian Literary Festival in Toronto to celebrate and explore Asian Canadian writings, past, present, and future, in partnership with the Asian Canadian Studies at University College and the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. This is a very meaningful event for our library because one of the East Asian Library's missions is to preserve and make accessible interdisciplinary knowledge and history of Asian Canadian communities and the Asian diaspora. I hope you all enjoy the event today. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, Literation on behalf of the <coughs> University of Toronto and be on behalf of our Asian Canadian Studies program. Uh, we are very grateful to the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, to the East Asian Library, to our very dedicated uh, committee members, and to the writers who very generously have offered their time to uh, hosts this first uh, Asian Canadian Literary Festival on the theme of Asian Canadian Literary Activism. And I would just like to thank you all for coming and participating because I feel the theme of literary activism is one that has, at least in my lifetime, profoundly changed Canadian culture. I'm old enough to remember the days when I had to really hunt uh, for Asian Canadian literature, and the selection was much less than it is now. And 
I can remember the impact of reading the Asian Indian with excitement, with reading the writings of each of the writers here and feeling like a new horizon had opened up in my mind. And I know many uh, Asian Canadians um, who, like myself, grew up in the 1970s and 80s felt this way, that we were kind of emerging as a generation of Asian Canadians, sometimes feeling like we didn't entirely have a roadmap of where to go with that. And while we were all kind of figuring it out, uh, we, do f we did feel that many of the imaginative <coughs> works and creative works and activism um, helped guide our way. And certainly now as a scholar of Asian Canadians and a teacher in our Asian Canadian Studies program, we continue to see the profound influence that the world of creative ideas has upon our communities, upon our, our, our young people, and on our imagination as a nation. And I just would like to just add a brief pitch uh, that we do offer a full suite of Asian Canadian Studies courses here at U of T so that if after this pa these panels you are, are hungry for more, uh, we have an Asian Canadian history course next semester. We offer Asian cultures in Canada every year. Uh, our two uh, moderators of the panels are scholars of Asian Canadian literature. And we have other classes like Asian Canadian Space and Place that looks at neighborhoods in Toronto and Chinese Canadian Studies, which looks specifically at Chinese communities and ongoing projects involving students uh, linking up with the community. Um, and so we are always trying to find ways to enhance learning and knowledge about Asian Canadians. And thank you for coming to this panel and being part of that ongoing conversation. And I hope you all have a wonderful time today. And I thank all of the organizers again for their incredible hard work and the panelists and moderators as well. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Now the theme for today is Asian literary activism. The dictionary definition of activism is the action of using vigorous campaigning to bring about political or social change. And today we'll examine the history, cultural influence, and the outcomes of Asian Canadian writers involved in changing society as a whole with their works. So our first panel is the history of Asian Canadian literary activism. will be moderated by Dr. Smero Camburelli. Mero is a professor in inaugural A.V. Bennett Chair in Canadian Literature, a specialist in contemporary Canadian literature and criticism. She was a Canada Research Chair in Critical Studies in Canadian Literature in the School of English and the Theatre Studies at the University of Guelph. And our three panelists here include Joy Kogawa, Chuck Kwan, and uh, Lynn Kutsukake. So please join me in welcoming them. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to be uh, part of the inaugural Literature um, Festival in Toronto. I lived for many years on the West Coast, and my introduction into Asian Canadian literature was through personal stories I heard from friends who happened to be major Asian Canadian writers like Roy Mickey, Roy Kiyoka, and of course, uh, Jim Wong Chu, who was a friend when I lived out there. So I think this is a, a, a belated, I mean, I'm glad it's happening, and I'm sure it will flourish. And of course, it's a real honor to be sitting next to Joy Kagawa, who is really a literary icon, a cultural icon in the country. Uh, she's the kind of person who doesn't need an introduction. So in the interest of time, I'm going to keep my introductory remarks very brief. Uh, Joy Kagawa was born in Vancouver in 1935 to Japanese-Canadian parents. During the Second World War, Joy and her family were forced to move to Slokan in the interior of BC, an injustice that, of course, she addresses in incredibly evocative ways in her 1981 novel, Obasan. This is a novel that has produced a major shift in the Canadian national imaginary. Uh, it made us uh, discover a part of Canadian <laughs> history many of us were not aware of. It invited us to think about Canadian history and the Canadian nation states injustices. And it's for that reason it has become a literary landmark. And it's not a, 
uh, an accident, of course, that it was mentioned in the parliament during the Japanese-Canadian redress uh, ceremony by the prime minister at the time. Of course, that's not your only novel. She's published fiction, poetry, non-fiction. I'll just mention briefly some of your titles, Gently to Nagasaki, Naomi's Tree, Naomi's Road, Emily Kato, Echuka, The Rain Ascents, and Woman in the Woods. Um, in 1986, Joy Kagawa was made a member of the Order of Canada. In 2006, she was a member she was made a member of the Order of British Columbia in 2010. The Japanese government honored her with the Order of the Rising Sun, quote, for her contribution to the understanding and preservation of, Canadi of Japanese Canadian history. So I will end my introductory remarks now and invite Joy to share with us her <coughs> ideas about literary activism. I will introduce the other speakers when the turn comes. Should I speak there or here? Wherever you feel more comfortable. This is on, <laughs> so you can speak here or you can stand. Oh, there. I think I'll stand sure. because then I can see Absolutely. people. <laughs> <coughs> I feel I could be here all day and all night to talk about activism because of the times that we're in. So I just want to leap right into the urgency of our times right now and I think activism is actually required of everybody at this point. I mean, what are we facing? We're, we're being told that um, we have 12 years to turn things around or we can't turn things around. I frankly think we're on the Titanic. We've hit the iceberg. We're going down. There are going to be billions maybe who die. I mean, there's, it's so unthinkable. So I think essentially we're in denial about all this. And so here we are, you know, partying on the Titanic or doing whatever it is we're doing. We're working away in the kitchen, doing all the things that we do. Meanwhile, the house is burning down. So I'm saying, all right, this is a time for activism right now. And um, so what can we do? I mean, I, I, I don't know anybody who's a Trump supporter in this room, <laughs> but uh, there's that caravan coming and there's that fear that's being stoked up. And what can we do? Can we go beyond ourselves to do what we can do? Is it worth it? And I think we do. Each of us has to go really far beyond our comfort level, our limits, and we have to act. So one of the things I was thinking about, I mean, years ago in about 19, when I first started um, publishing poetry, one of the poems I wrote was called Invasions, and it was exactly about the situation today. And I was just um, starting, and I, of course, I just thought I was writing fiction. I couldn't have imagined that it would be coming true. Uh, I wish I had the poem here. I was going to bring it, but I forgot. <laughs> and so maybe I could um, mail it out to somebody, and they could send it out if they want to. But it's about um, the invasions that were stopping by building walls, by saying no, no to hunger, or saying no to all this invasion. And by doing that, we're, we're saying no to the invasion of love. So what I'm saying here is, let us be invaded by love. And look what, you know, here's an idea. I know that Canada wants to deport 10,000 people a year. That's what I read. And so all this thing about the people coming across the border, how many are we going to keep out? How, how many people will have to come before we also start talking with fear about being invaded by people? So what are we going to do about that? And I think we have to go beyond ourselves in this time of xenophobia and practice phylozenia, which is a word we all need to have, which is love of the stranger rather than fear of the stranger. P-H-I-L-O-X-E-N-I-A. Phylozenia. Let it become a part of our vocabulary. Let us practice that. And what can we say? You know, if there were five people in this room who would say, yes, let's welcome the migrants. Uh, let's welcome the people that are coming. Let's not put up these walls. Let's be open-hearted. Let's go beyond ourselves. Is it worth it? Could we stop Trump from being elected if we said in Canada, let them come through the states. We'll take them. I asked a reporter how many people he thought would agree to that. And he thought one in five. I thought one in a thousand in this country. But one in a thousand would be a lot of people. If some of us were to say, okay, let's do that. 
Let's get together. Let's write this letter. Let's sign it. Let's put our names on it. Let's send it to Trump. Let's send it to the newspaper. Let's say Canada is still open. And let the Canadian government and the people who are afraid deny this. <coughs> but why don't the few of us who want to do this do this? Why don't you give me your names and your phone numbers and I'll get in touch with you? One of you, two of you, three of you, five of you. That would be fantastic. Then we could get together and we could plan, and this is activism. And this is saying, I can make a difference. I can imagine a difference. I can do this. So at the end, leave me your phone number. Leave me your email address. And I'll put you on a list with some, because I'm going to be going to Ottawa after this. And it happens that that poem <coughs> about invasions is going to be, it's been set to music. And so I'm going to go and hear this concert. And I'm going to say this very thing to the people there. Who will give me your numbers? Can we get this tiny little movement going? Can we send a letter? Can we send this letter to the newspapers? Can we publicize the fact that here we are the country from come from away? We stand for this. We may be the last outpost in the world that can still do this. Maybe, you know what Brazil is doing and how terrifying that is. I mean, we need our lungs. We need the trees. And here's this threatening us. So, all right, I'm an activist. I became an activist not when I was writing about San, I certainly wasn't. Am I, is my time yet? Yes, I'll let you know. <laughs> anyway, when I was writing about San, I didn't have an activist bone or a, or a you know, political bone in my body. I really didn't know anything at all. And then, um, when I started writing Itzka, I still didn't. I was going to write The Reign of Sins when I was starting to write Itzka. So you'll see, you know, I mean, I think that's where I was going with that one. I was dealing with um, some demons in my life and, and needing to find a way to look at it. So that's what I was doing there and thinking about Southern Alberta, thinking about the Bible Belt, and so I was doing that. Then suddenly I got hijacked into the redress movement. I found out um, about different things that were going on in the United States and in Canada, and somehow I dropped the writing I got involved in the redress movement all throughout the 80s. I worked and worked and worked for that. And, um, and that was when I got transformed from being Naomi Nakane in Obasan to Emily Kato. I became her. And I, you know, I could never have dreamed that I would have had been able to talk in front of people because uh, I couldn't. And I was so shy. And the first time I was asked to do anything like reading, I just stood there. I got so scared, I just walked off. You know, and, there still is some of that fear there, but, but over time, Emily took hold. There's other people that have taken hold, and I could tell you tons of things about who has been in me, like Minnie Votrin. When I ran into Minnie Votrin in uh, The Rape of Nanking, she was a missionary there, she took hold of me, and she's saying, I want my story told. This gives me lots of trouble here amongst Japanese Canadians from the Japanese government on. And, and so I'm seen now as this strident voice, creating conflict, creating trouble. But Minnie is here. She is saying to me, get my story out. It's a true story. It really happened. It should not be denied. In genocide, there are many stages of it, how it happens very slowly, very subtly. The last stage of genocide which is an ongoingness of genocide, is to deny that it happened. And this is what Japan is trying to do. They're trying to say, look, we've talked about it. We've apologized. We've given enough money. We don't want to talk about it anymore. Let it go away. If you can be silenced, great. And so the National Association that I worked so hard to establish, I really worked hard for that, it has come under that power, that, that pressure, to be silent, not to talk about it. And it opposed the movement in um, Queen's Park when um, Su Wong wanted to establish December 13 as a day to remember the rape of Nanking. And I was there to support her, and the community was against me. The National Association was against me, so I'm in trouble. But that's what it is. It, that's the cost. You do what you believe is right. You risk being hated by your best friends and you go ahead anyway, because if you don't, what happens? This ongoing denial or effort to deny it is causing huge amount of pain and is being used politically in many kinds of ways, very negatively. 
So what do we do? Fall into the silence? I, not for me. For somebody else, it might be the right way. And I will respect that. I respect other people's opinions when it's their conscience that is telling them, if we are quiet, we will not have conflict. If we are quiet, we will, it'll go away. It'll never go away if you are quiet. So, so that's where, you know, so, so I'm this strident, horrible voice, you know, I, and I know that. And it's really, really awful to be there. I'm, I'm active about so many things. I, I wish I could tell you, but my time's up, I bet. You have five more minutes, actually. Oh, <laughs> I'll tell you then. I've been to Okinawa. And that's an amazing, amazing place and an amazing history. I want to talk about that. I wrote about that in uh, Gently to Nagasaki. But that's the only country, the only modern nation in the entire world, as far as I know, that had equal sharing between men and women at the top. That is, the women were the leaders of the spiritual world, and their king could not govern without them. They were called divine priestesses, so they shared power. They became the longest living people in the world, the most peaceful nation. And, and they've been 70 years resisting the overtaking of their land by um, the military, the American military bases. So I've become an activist for that too. And on December 1, if you would like to come and see a film about this, then give me your names and email addresses and I'll put you on the list for the people that are going to let you know when that is and where that is and what that is about. But Okinawa needs our support. Okinawa needs actually to be highlighted. They should be at that Parliament of World Religions that I'm going to write after this. And Okinawa's story should be there. It's a world religion that was um, just, but look where it led to as far as the people are concerned. I'm sure I'm, my time's up now. <laughs> Could you please circulate a piece of paper so that we write down those of us who want what an incredible call to activism, <laughs> inspiring, moving, you just embody what we should all be practicing as citizens of the world and of this country. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's amazing. I'm really moved. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure to introduce the second uh, panelist, Lynn Kutsukake, who is a third generation Japanese Canadian. She's worked for many years in this very building as a librarian at the University of Toronto, specializing in the collection of Japanese titles. Her short story, Mating, originally published in the Dalhousie Review, was a, final, a finalist for the prestigious Journey Prize in 2010. The previous year, another short story, Away, first published in Grain Magazine, was a finalist again for the same prize. She has published many short stories in various magazines, including The Windsor Review, Rice Paper, and Prairie Fire. And her first novel, The Translation of Love, appeared recently. I just began reading it. I'm sorry, I haven't finished it yet. Too busy with end of the term work. But I'm really captivated by the novel, and I would recommend it very highly. So please, Lynn, you're next. Thank you. Well, I'll speak from here, if I may. Um, it's very funny how life moves in circles. There are many, many circles. So the first circle and connection is that I should find myself sitting here <laughs> in my former workplace <laughs> and thinking about, oh yes, shelving over there and <laughs> cataloging to do over there and you know running to the reference desk back there. And uh, I'm really deeply honored to be here. It's a new crew in charge under Hannah Kim. And I'm really pleased that the East Asian Library is taking such a an activist role in providing a forum for these kinds of, of talks, because we really didn't do that before in the past. And so it's just terrific. So that's one thing, and I want to give a shout out to all my colleagues, former colleagues, who very kindly came to hear me. Another part of this amazing connection, which really is by coincidence, but maybe not. Maybe something else is happening. Um, I was a member of the Asianadian mm -hmm. magazine, the Asianadian collective, 
which was founded 40 years ago. And one of the founding members, Chuck Kwan, is here today. And we've stayed in touch over the years. So um, it's just a great honor to be here um, because of that connection. And that magazine, working on that magazine, and also meeting all the people who worked on it, was my first, what we used to call in those days, a consciousness raising. I think that we all go through life, well, maybe not everybody, but particularly when you're a person of color, um, you, <coughs> you are seeking your identity, and I think you're also seeking, at the same time, community. The two are connected. You find your identity often through finding community. And I found this community first with the Asian Canadian. We were Japanese Canadian, we were Chinese Canadian, we were South Asian Canadian, and we worked together. It was really an astonishing, blossoming time. It was while I was working for the Asian Canadian Collective that my good friend Momoe Sugiman, also a member of the collective, and I uh, decided to approach Joy Kogawa, who neither of us knew at the time, for an interview. So we interviewed her before Obasan was even published. She was a famous poet, so that's how we knew of her. And so we had this fabulous interview, which is in one of our archive um, uh, issues. And that was how I first met Joy. And then life carried on, and then we did different things. And then lo and behold, um, after I was no longer associated with the Asian Canadian, but I'd gone to Japan and then come back and was doing other things, actually studying Japanese literature here. Um, once again, I came into Joy's orbit because of the redress movement. And it was at that time, at the very beginning of the movement, um, Joy was really spearheading things because um, she had opened up her house to all these Japanese Canadians. <laughs> And often she wasn't even there, but we would go for meetings there. <laughs> you remember? I mean, your door was wide open all the time. And one of the things that I remember doing, uh, because I was really sort of, uh, sort of backroom kind of, you know, stamp licking and envelope uh, licking activist, you know, not, not out in the forefront like Joy or like Chuck. But one of the things we did, one of the first projects, was to try to develop a mailing list of Japanese Canadians in Toronto. So just to back up a bit, I think this is well known to many of you, but in case it's not well known, just bear with me, at the at the end of the war, when Japanese Canadians were still in internment camps in BC, the Canadian government decided, under enormous pressure from a very racist government in British Columbia, that Japanese Canadians would not be allowed to return to the West Coast. Instead, but you couldn't stay in the internment camps either. The war was ending. <laughs> You had to choose to move east of the Rockies and scatter. So the, the important component that you not only had to move east of the Rockies, but you were ordered to scatter, not to form a community again, or go to Japan. And there were sort of incentives. You know, if you want to go to Japan, they'll pay the you know, free passage to Japan. War devastated Japan. So when Japanese Canadians moved to places in Ontario, such as Toronto, Hamilton, and so forth, um, well, of course, people kept in touch, families kept in touch, 
But there was no community the way there had been in Japantown in Vancouver. So it wasn't as though you knew where everybody was. In fact, the community, as government policy had hoped would work out, the community was basically destroyed. So we didn't know who the other person was or where we were. Uh, there were probably lists of people who went to you know, the Buddhist church or people who attended the JCCC. But for the most part, there were lots of people who had fallen through the gaps. We didn't know each other. So there was a project. <laughs> and you're young, so many of you, so you, you, you can't even imagine this. But so this is pre, pre social media days, pre internet. In the olden days, it sounds so ancient. There used to be something called a telephone book. Yes. <laughs> you might have seen these, you might remember them. They no longer exist. And Toronto is, was a fairly big city by that point. <laughs> we went through the telephone book, you know? Well, we, we, we cut it up and in groups. We went through it, you know, with a ruler line by line, because the old-fashioned telephone book, um, most people had their names in it, and the telephone book had um, telephone numbers, but also addresses. So we went through this telephone book looking for Japanese-looking names. And sometimes we made a mistake, you know. <laughs> it, it wasn't really a Japanese name. And of course, you might miss somebody because they had changed their name when they married. But, you know, we picked up names this way. So this was the early days of creating a database. It wasn't even a database, it was like a paper list, a typed list, typewriter, uh, <coughs> list of uh, names and addresses, uh, which became the foundation for making a mailing list, for sending out information about redress, and also for publishing a newspaper. Um, I guess in the early days it was a newsletter, but the, the very first newspaper called Nikkei Voice, which Joy started. <laughs> All comes back to Joy. <laughs> so those are just some, um, you know, um, anecdotes about the ancient historical days, <laughs> but I remember them very fondly. And you know, my connection with these two guys is really, um, it just warms my heart. So I, I don't have too much else to say, just that um, I think that um, one thing we can say is that uh, literature itself can be a very powerful force for activism because of, of what it says, but also how it can move people because of its content, but also about you know uh, who, who is reading it. And I think that um, Lisa, uh, Professor Marr was, was mentioning, her old days are actually very young days, but I remember really old days when um, <clears throat> there was hardly any Asian, American, Asian Canadian literature. It was really hard to find. And like once every few years, oh, a book would come out, and you get very excited, and you would buy it. And then sometimes maybe um, a couple of books would come out in one year, and that was like cause for great celebration. So now we're in an era when there's a tremendous flourishing of publishing of Asian um, Canadian books. But I do think it's still hard. You know, there's a lot of um, competition to be able to publish. There's a lot of, a lot of, you know, I think people of color, writers of color still have to um, push a little harder than other people. But I do think that, um, oh, one other thing I wanted to say was that um, I think that it's also uh, this movement that literature provides, it's one format <clears throat> to move from, um, Invisibility, like if you have no voice and nobody hears you or nobody sees you or because you're the only Asian in the room, nobody even looks at you or 
or you know <coughs> answers your question that um, you're really kind of invisible and to try to make yourself more visible is part of the whole um, movement I think and um, the ability <coughs> to publish and to be read to have these stories that nobody else was really interested in before you know I think they're interested now, but the pioneers at the time, it was remarkable what they did to break through and to bring these topics to the foreground because um, it's this telling of stories that had been sort of well suppressed or left untold or unheard or ignored or to make them visible and to push them forward and to have more and more people read them. I think it's just a part of a long continuum, but it actually still never stops. It's not like you reach a point where, okay, now we've made it. You know, like Obama was elected and, you know, we entered the post-racial society. So then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think I've spoken far too long. Thank you Thank so you. much, Lynn. Of course, I just realized the obvious that I'm sitting at the table with the pioneers of, you know, literary and cultural activism. It's, it's a real honor and you're all, you know, so inspiring. So it's a real pleasure to introduce the third speaker on this panel, Chuk Kwan, who is known for a number of things, including the um, uh, journal, the magazine, Asinadi, Asianadian, which he founded in 1978, which is a progressive influential magazine dedicated to the promotion of Asian Canadian arts, culture, and politics. Um, he was born in Hong Kong and grew up in Singapore and Japan. And after he studied engineering in the US, he moved to Canada in 1976, where he has been um, pursuing uh, a career in IT. Of course, he's also known for the um, very inspiring series of uh, documentaries, Chinese restaurants, uh, which of course offers um, a very interesting, inspiring, and historical view of one of the most um, iconic elements of Chinese Canadian um, society and culture. Um, he, is, uh, he has traveled in many cities in India and other places. Uh, he's been into the jungles of Brazilian Amazon, and he's come face to face with Chinese communities who have transcended geographical, political, and social frontiers. His work uh, on the ground and through documentaries and cultural publications embodies the spirit, the best of the diasporic spirit. So please welcome Chu Kwan. I've always thought that writing is a form of protest and also a activism. I can safely say without Obasa, we would not have the Japanese redress movement. Yes, that's true. That's true, right? Yes. Yeah. Joy, you, you did yeah. a great job. You didn't even know you were protesting <laughs> when you wrote Joy Obasa. Uh, so when I arrived in, in Canada um, in 1976, I was actually, um, I, I lived in Japan, I grew up in a Japanese culture. So in that sense, uh, I have a big affinity for the Japanese Canadians. So in around 1977, I was working in a Chinese Canadian magazine called The Crossroads, and it's a Chinese language publication. Uh, it deals with arts, writing, and of course politics. Um, a lot of that is Chinese politics, uh, Mao, you know, Taiwan, and other things. So it was a fairly progressive magazine. And sometime around 1978, we decided that we wanted to do a bilingual uh, edition, meaning that half of them would be in English. And so I recruited Tony Chan one of the other co-founder in the um, uh, Asian Indian magazine to, to, to be the English editor. And he put together half of the magazine in English, articles, you know, writing, and so forth. But some, somewhere along the way, um, 
we thought that doing a bilingual magazine is a waste of resources and it's not effective because the, the half of people who read Chinese would not bother with the English side and the people who read English, of course, would not know Chinese. And that's why they are reading the English in the first place. So we decided to split and it was a bit of a form of rebellion and, and secession. Um, so we did, on April Fool's Day, 1978, uh, the three co-founders, myself, Tony Chen, and Paul Levine, also known as Lao Bo, um, met at the Mars Food Diner on College Street. It's still around after 40 years. Uh, we had bacon and eggs, and we had breakfast, and then we decided, okay, we're gonna split, up, and then we start this magazine. The problem then is, uh, by that time, half the magazine had been, the, the, the English part has been typewritten in, in, into this kind of format, right? So this was done, back to Lynn's uh, thing about po uh, pre-internet, pre, this is pre-PC. <laughs> <laughs> and when I gave a talk at the Vancouver Alliteration, I had to show a picture of the IBM's electric typewriter, because <laughs> I was afraid people would not, would not know where a typewriter looks like. <laughs> so anyway, this was all type, typewritten in uh, IBM's electric twice, because you had to justify and you got to count how many words and, and all these things, and then paste on a drafting board, uh, and then we sent to the printer. But by that time, um, everywhere it says Crossroads, we have a problem. Uh, we had to change the name of the magazine. Uh, Crossroads is 10 letters. So Tony and I were looking at each other and say, we need to find a name that fits 10 letters. And that's when Tony came up with the word Asian Canadian, Asian Canadian. Uh, and of course, the rest is history. Uh, I just want to read, f and of course, Tony also had to write our manifesto, which is the editorial and the first issue, very first issue that we, uh, uh, we put. And I just want to read one paragraph uh, from here, and this has to do with activism, which we didn't know at that time. The Asian Indian will continue to speak out against those factors, whether conditions or persons, perpetuating racism in Canada. It will stand up against the distortion of our history in Canada, stereotypes, economic exploitation, and the general tendency towards injustice and inequality practiced on visible minorities, visible minorities in quote. So at that time, we did, we did not like the word visible minority, but because that kind of treated us like, almost like an alien. Uh, so hence, we decided that we would form a Asian Canadian identity and push uh, on the arts front, on the writing front, and basically general uh, consciousness raising. And I would spend most of my 80s away from Canada, but s since I came back, uh, almost 30 years ago, I've run to five people who told me, when they found out who I was, they told me, oh, when I was at U of T, I went to the library and read every single issue of the Asian AD magazine. And today I found Lisa, <laughs> <laughs> whom we helped uh, uh, in her uh, early career. So I, I'm, I'm truly grateful, Lisa, for bringing this up. And, and this is not uh, just Lisa, but this hap also happened to uh, members of our collective who join us because they read us somewhere else. Um, which brings me to Rahim. Rahim uh, is a collective member as well. Um, and of course, Lynn. Uh, so so we, we continued publishing uh, and we were uh, fairly progressive. Um, we were the first Asian Canadian magazine, and to deal with uh, things like uh, we are anti-sexist, anti-racist, anti-homophobic, and so in that sense, uh, we were up in the forefront. And I just want to show you a few covers um, um, of what we dealt with uh, on our second year. Second, uh, this is volume two, number one. This is sexuality. We're talking about being gay and being Asian. 
in Toronto. This is 1979. Uh, we have an issue on children, uh, children rights, poetry written by children, uh, and then of course, uh, welfare of the children. Uh, we have a issue on political movements um, at that time dealing with uh, many of the issues, including locally W5, anti-W5 movement that I will talk a little bit about. Uh, we for, after the referendum, we, we, we had an issue um, put out in Quebec uh, by, by our friends in Montreal. It was edited in Halifax and was printed in Toronto. So we were fairly <laughs> transnational at that time. <laughs> And then, of course, uh, we w went to Jim Wong Chu, and he got his friends to put together the uh, Vancouver issue. So, uh, w and then we have, of course, other things. Uh, we were the first, uh, we had an issue on Muslims in Canada. We have an issue on mental health. Uh, this is way before an anything, anybody ever talked about mental health, so we talked about mental health in the Asian community. Uh, and the problem that we face in, in, in this area, uh, and, and so on and so on. We were the first one to uh, interview uh, Joy Kogawa. We interviewed Wayne Wang when his uh, film Chan is Missing came out. Uh, this was before he came, became famous and directed the Joy Luck Club, which begets the rich, crazy rich Asians. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, we had done a, a lot of uh, pushing and pulling. Um, among uh, writers that wrote uh, first for us, Kerry Sakamoto, who later came out with her first book called Electric Field. We published M.G. Vasanji. Uh, we were published the South Asian poet Cyril Dabadine. And I think Lynn wrote for us as well. Uh, and um, we first published a short story by Rick Xiaomi called UBC Coed Kidnapped. It was a, his kind of humor, humor, satirical take on the, uh, Humphrey Bogart and you know, featuring a Japanese Canadian uh, private eye saving a Japanese Canadian beauty from the UBC campus. <laughs> so this became a play called yeah, The Yellow Fever. So this was The Yellow Fever in 1982, was the first Asian play to play in Broadway. It was, it was uh, off Broadway, it was uh, in Toronto and Vancouver, it opened in Broadway as well. So for that, we are very proud um, that we had support all these people. So in that sense, we do our best, uh, we do our, um, our best to, to help uh, with um, everybody, and of course, you know, art, arts-wise, uh, uh, this was a feature um, that we gave space to our Montreal artist Lao Tin Yam, uh, who later became very famous in Montreal, uh, as well. Um, in Vancouver, we had uh, a bunch of writers uh, under Jim Wong Chu's leadership that had uh, blossomed uh, because of what they've done also in Asian Indian. But I, was, I also want to mention our dear friend Jim Wong Chu. Uh, he and I went back a long ways, but basically uh, we were influenced basically a lot by what was happening in San Francisco and what was happening in Vancouver with the Asian uh, American and Asian Canadian consciousness raising. I know that in, in Vancouver it was the Power Street Review uh, where the Chinese Canadian and Japanese Canadian side-by-side -side community in Vancouver uh, across Panda Street uh, would collaborate on many, many projects, many of them activist projects uh, that not just celebrate Lunar New Year or the, um, the Oban Festival, but also had an underlying theme of rebellion and, and activism, meaning that we're not uh, just a visible minority to you, uh, we are part of Canadian. Um, so the legacy of, uh, of, of um, the magazine, of course, uh, it, the magazine met its demise in 1985 <laughs> after the seventh year, the sixth issue that we uh, published. And we were kind of dispersed. Uh, Raheem went to South Africa for 30 years. 
uh, I went away, <laughs> and the founders went away. Um, Lynn came here <laughs> to the library. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the spirit kind of lived on, and as I mentioned before, there are a lot of people who told me uh, 30 years after we, um, that we, they had, we had a big influence. And nothing more so than last two years. Um, three things happened last two years. Um, first of all, in 2016, uh, Alice Jim, a professor from Concordia, published an article on Asian Indian, uh, the magazine, and our influence in the arts community, and uh, how we push for Asian Canadian consciousness. That was in a journal somewhere. So this was the first time somebody ever dedicated an entire article to our magazine, which is wonderful to us, because we've been quoted in, in many other books and publications, but never an uh, academic scholarly article that uh, talks about us. And then uh, a year ago, uh, a PhD student from York called me up, and she said, I'm gonna do a uh, thesis on you guys and John Paul Sartre and existentialism. I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that took about a year and a half, and um, I, I have, I'm happy to report that she defended the thesis. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was there. Uh, the thesis is called Hybridity and Resistance in Theory in Practice, the Asian Indian 1978 and 1985. And if you go through her book, uh, I, I, I can barely read any of these because I'm not academic. I have no idea what she's talking about. <laughs> so this is a, this is for the Department of Philosophy. <laughs> but she, she's now gonna turn this into a book. And uh, she wants some help and so said, no problem. Uh, I'm so happy that somebody else have, um, have, have, have um, kind of uh, a legacy have actually continued. But the most important thing was, the most surprising thing was about a year ago, uh, the same time when Jim Wong Chu's um, a tribute, I had come up to, I have came, I come up to Toronto, the UT library here for the tribute when I walked past um, Chinatown and I saw posters in the yellow wall by the Chinatown, you know, where the garage goes down. There were posters about Asian Indian. And the poster says, grassroots activism. And it's got a crossword puzzle with lines like feminism, sexism, um, and all these things that we, we, we dealt with. And then in the little text there, the talks basically talks about uh, how progressive we have been. And I have no idea who put those up. Uh, there was no names, nothing. It was like a Bansky thing. You know, you suddenly overnight, they, they got pasted up all over Chinatown. And some of them are still there right now, uh, today. So a year and a half after uh, it was put up. Um, and then we found out there were two OCAS students who came to the library here and looked up the, the magazine and read through every single issue and they were so inspired uh, and these are 25 year olds, right? 35 years after the demise, they decided um, that they would do a poster in honor of us. And I have, we have no idea until a year, about three months ago, we tracked them down because I happened to find the, on the internet uh, where they were, who they were. But we were so surprised because we thought that for sure somebody from OCAT must have told them about our Asian Indian. They were too young to remember anything, right? <laughs> Much less a typewriter or, or a telephone book. But anyway, that's the legacy that uh, we're super happy about. Uh, more than anything else, I think um, the spirit continues. Yeah. Thank you. I am really moved because, uh, as I said before, we have here um, three incredible individuals who have dedicated their intellectual, social, personal activities and lives to all kinds of interesting causes. And I, I am, for one, really moved. And I want to thank you as, as an individual, as a diasporic Canadian, for what you've done you up in so many ways. So we've seen different examples of activism, literary or not, grassroots activism, letting yourself be invaded by love, letting your door open so that people can come in and do work, uh, practicing phylogenia. Is that, that's kind of a, 
new Greek word that has a Greek, I don't know how to pronounce, phylogenia. Philo <laughs> phylogenia, okay. Uh, so uh, we have time, and I would like to invite you um, to ask questions, make comments, and of course, you're more than welcome to speak to each other here at the table. Any questions or any comments? Sure, yes. There's a mic that can come to closer to you if you have something to say. Hi. Oh, I just have a question concerning archives and databases, concerning, considering the setting and what has been said today. Um, I'm just thinking about the dangers of them and the, how you take care of the people on them and the information that could be misused. And recent news announced in BC by Harry Baines, the Minister of Labor there, where he put in new legislation that will require employers and recruiters of temporary foreign workers to be registered rather than the workers themselves. And for a lot of activists, we're making these networks and we're not sure how to protect the folks on them how to work with them. So with your experience, how have you managed those relations and tried to take care of the people? I didn't get the question, so you have to tell me. Yeah. It's, it's really we don't quite get your question. What were you trying to say? Yeah. Um, I don't think, I'm not comfortable speaking to a microphone, so this is a okay, okay, question. Yeah, yeah um, it's just that like archives could be misused at times just by certain folks, especially if they get into the wrong hands. So when you're creating databases, getting people's names and stuff, how do you work to take care, of, to make sure those people, to take care of that information so it doesn't get misused? How do you protect? So your question is yeah. how, because you couldn't hear you very well. Sorry. I can't hear you all. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, how you can, you created a database of these names that, you know, we put on the, how can you uh, guarantee the privacy or protection or yeah. that the names are put to good use? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. I think you're thinking of the anecdote that I shared about going through the telephone book yeah. and looking yeah. for the yeah. names. So there was a second stage after that. We came up with our list of names that we thought, well, they're Japanese Canadians. And some people, like, they knew them. Oh, yeah, that's, that's Harry. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's OK. Or, yeah, well, that's my uncle, or whatever. But some people we didn't know. Anyway, when it came to um, trying to, in the very early days, trying to sort of contact people and let them know that there was a redress movement starting and maybe you would like to come to one of the information meetings. They were held at, sometimes at schools and sometimes at the local churches. Um, uh, one thing, I, I think I only did this one time. It was like being at a call center. Somebody had organized um, at his office after hours that we could use all the phones there. And we, so we went through the list. I think this thing took several evenings, and we called people to verify if they were Japanese Canadian and if they would like information about um, redress. So it was sort of at that personal level we were doing it, reaching out. But I know what you mean about issues of privacy, right? I mean, you've collected a name, but maybe the person on the other end doesn't want you to have that name, or maybe you don't want to disclose that name. I know that when the lists of, of people were used to form a mailing list to in, send out the initial issues of Nikkei Voice, I think they just went out. They were, the, the copies of the newspaper were sent out for free. And then I think there was just a natural sort of winnowing or attrition some people wanted to continue to receive it, and some people didn't. But you know, we're talking about an era when it was not like today, which is, I understand your concerns because it's the digital information is really scary. It's everywhere, and you know who has control over it. It is a real concern right now, privacy. I think we were more, it was a different era, quite different. 
and we didn't have to we didn't yeah we didn't think about that at all I don't think but yeah how, how do you do it how do you do it what do you do I'm just curious I was part of a group where we were working with detainees uh, in definite detention in Canada and we had to stop our work because we couldn't have the people that were protect from the cabin. So we just for now we're on pause. Mm. Yeah, and they couldn't uh, he was involved in a group and they, of course they couldn't they didn't have the resources to protect the, the privacy of the people they stopped for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think privacy is a huge issue yes. right now. Um, privacy of all of our data. I think, yeah. I think um, Statistics Canada wants to have access to all Canadians' banking information. <laughs> I just read that in the newspaper. <laughs> It's interesting, I was uh, in New York last week when there were the bomb threats, and it was really strange. I was there with a group of Canadian colleagues for a series of meetings, and we all received on Canadian cell phone numbers, 416 kind of numbers or 647 kind of numbers, emergency calls from the Canadian government agency about the, about the bombs. And we were as much concerned about the bomb threats as about the fact that they could access our own phones. It was really strange. But one thing I want to kind of uh, mention in this context and then invite more questions is, I uh, remind you of the phrase that I believe Joy used, that we have often to go beyond our comfort zone in order to try and make a difference. And so given the kind of era within which we live when we don't know where information, how our information is used, who is accessing it, Sometimes, depending on the cause you take on, you know, you have to take some risks, and sometimes that means <coughs> subscribing to a list that you don't necessarily know how it works. I know I've done it myself a few times, with, you know, without many regrets, I must say. So, any other comments or questions about the inspiring stories? You want to say something, Joy? Yes, there's a question there. Hi, you've all done a lot in terms of bringing the Asian Canadian cause, I guess, forward. And you've, you're all trailblazers in this field. And I'm wondering, thinking about what's happening today, to Joy's point, there's a lot going on. Um, is there anything happening around this time or around Asian Canadian literary activism that really gets you excited? New voices, new um, movements, kind of the future of, uh, of people building upon what you all have started that gets you really excited and, and thinking, this is exactly what we started all of this for. Um, I, actually, my mind was, was on the other question, if I, you know, about privacy. And um, so I wanted to just speak to this, this list of names that have been given here. Um, if, any, if everybody who's put their name down is okay with it, it'll go on to a list of names um, of people who get information about a series of things that, are, that some of us put together. And it's called We Should Know Each Other is the name of this um, series. And uh, on December the 1st, there is going to be um, the film about Okinawa. So these names will go on that if if the person who's doing the names can read everything, and you'll be you'll know then that this film is happening. If anybody doesn't want to be on a list or doesn't you know wants their name hidden, I mean this this goes out to people individually, so you're not your your name is not revealed to anybody else. Um, and if you're uncomfortable with it, all you have to do is say take my name off. You know, I don't want to know about any more of these. Um, and, and the idea I was putting out there about, you know, getting together and sending this letter out <laughs> about um, welcoming migrants, there may be some of you who feel uncomfortable with, with um, your name being on a list like that. So I, what I would like to do is when I get back from Ottawa and when I get back from doing some of the things I'm doing, I'd like to send a note out to you and say, would you like to get together and talk about this? And if you want to, you can respond. 
and we can find a place to meet. Um, one in a thousand, I thought. <laughs> this is a, a huge list, and I'm just so thrilled that you were willing to put your names down. Now, what was the other question? Okay, the question, <coughs> do you mind repeating your question? Uh, My question was about um, Asian Canadian literary activism today, and what what do you personally find exciting about the things that are hap what Asian Canadians are doing today to take your work forward? Well, what I, what I personally feel about this is that um, I have a very small, very fragile group of people called Japanese Canadians for Social Justice. They're terrified. They don't want their names out there at all. They want anonymity. They're afraid of being targeted by other Japanese Canadians for the things that they believe. So they want this to be a very anonymous group. What I wanted is to say, we're not going to ever be a large group. I mean, we, we may be someday when the thing tilts, you know, and when there is more support for a certain point of view. But what about an Asian Canadians for social justice or an Asian Canadians for social activism or something like that? If you want to do it, anybody can do that. You just have to send a, get together with a few people and say, let's do this. Or if you want to join Japanese Canadians for Social Justice and make it into Asian Canadians, we've talked about that. Um, we could do that. Uh, we can do anything. And we should do everything that we can think of that we can do at this, at this time in history. I think we really have to go beyond ourselves. We have to be willing to be really uncomfortable okay. and uh, stand up and say, you know, I'm going to do everything I can for the kids of the future, for your future, you're all young. I'm, you know, I'm 83. And I'm passionate for, um, well, I'm just passionate about this, this planet, you know, which is a beautiful planet to be on. So that's where I am. I'd like to respond to your question, which I think is a very good one. I think all of us probably know <laughs> that, you know, there are like, lots and lots of new writing coming out from younger people of you know Asian Canadian background dealing uh, sometimes with um, well historical matters and sometimes just with what life is like right now as a contemporary young Asian Canadian um, and in addition, you know, I just saw quite recently a performance by um, uh, some young Japanese Canadians. The next generation down, like I'm Sansei, which is third generation. The generation that is, you know, coming into their own, really blossoming right now, is the fourth generation, the Yonsei. And some of them are, are five, uh, Gosei. So uh, these uh, young people, these Yonsei actors, are based in Vancouver, and they are um, they're graduates of the UBC um, drama and film program there, many of them. Um, they are now traveling across the country, I think, putting on a performance called um, um, Hastings Park, or... Um, the Japanese the Japanese suitcase? problem, yes. Is it the suitcase problem? Japanese problem. And uh, what they are doing is creating a, a space where they recreate what it was like to be in um, the stables in Hastings Park, of the Pacific National Exhibition area in Vancouver. Uh, what, that is, that, what that was like then, but also playing with being in being a contemporary person um, dealing with this and uh, they spoke about it after the performance and one thing that struck me was um, that they're very political and that they they came to it they said some of them said you know I was taken to this place as a child to ride the roller coaster you know it's it's a, an exhibition park it's amusement park and, you know, we walked right past the stables, and we had no idea. And so they're digging this out again. And they're like, they were, they, you could see the passion. They were quite incensed that other people were, you know, at the fair had no idea that Japanese Canadians had been held there. And they wanted to focus on this 
and their way of doing it was through art, through dramatic performance. And I read somewhere that they had put on the first performances actually in the Pacific National Exhibit, the Hastings Park. So that must have been pretty extraordinary. But I think it's an ongoing thing that's continuing. And yeah, there are other projects, aren't there? There's another one called Pro Suitcase Project. That's another um, exhibition. But I think that the, the new generation, well, it's actually the contemporary generation, is uh, doing all sorts of extraordinary things. It's time for one quick question. Yes, there's someone there. Um, so my question was, I guess, to any of the panelists, um, and I just wanted to ask about your experience or maybe your difficulties in fostering cross-community um, solidarities within sort of this broad umbrella of Asian Canadians. So getting different communities to come on board with the Japanese Canadian projects and kind of vice versa, maybe your experiences in, in that kind of work. So would you like to take um. With a lot of difficulty, uh, but you have to be inspired to do that. Um, you have to be strongly believed that we, we are all together in this thing, and united is strength and all that cliche. But basically, uh, it took, in the early days, it was, uh, uh, I think it was tough for us in a sense. I mean, um, just because a lot of us know each other a bit and then be introduced by other people, so we have that affinity. But when you go out to the reach, reach to the high, uh, kind of a larger community, uh, you will get backlash like what Joy did, uh, Joy uh, received. Uh, because I know that even in the Japanese redress movement, there were a lot of um, Sansei and Yonsei, they were more progressive and they were, um, you know, the nieces are, are the ones who want to keep quiet because they don't want to talk about it. They just want to be white and merge into the society. So that, that's a, that's a uh, uh, d dilemma and a struggle, intergenerational struggle, and we have a lot of that. Uh, in the Chinese community, there's the, uh, after the redress, uh, there was the Chinese redress, head tax. And there were two factions, basically. You know, you can split the Chinatown Chinese community in half. Uh, one half would say, no, 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 let's not rock, rock the boat. Um, and uh, the other half are ones that say, hey, we need redress. Uh, the same thing happened in the NTW5 movement. Uh, we were called names by uh, uh, elders in Chinatown who didn't want us to be protesting and marching down Bloor Street. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of things like that, and between, uh, like to answer your question, um, among communities, there is uh, uh, at that time there was uh, people who just, and you had to fight for it, but, but, but people were coming out and saying, "Hey, there is something to be said about working across community." Uh, there were a lot of us, uh, I, I guess, organization. There's one called intercultural, uh, cross-cultural communication center at that time in Toronto uh, that dealt with a lot of immigrant groups uh, and helped them kind of uh, link with each other. Uh, pretty much like what Joy did with, uh, oh, oh, with, uh, with uh, what Lynn did with the telephone book. Uh, you start your own community and you start thinking about how can I reach out to the other people. And Asian Indian, I can say it was the, kind of the first publication at least to try to amalgamate our readership and say, hey, uh, let's, let's all um, no, uh, uh, develop our consciousness together. I would just like to say one thing, you know, Chuck. Uh, it wasn't necessarily intergenerational conflict. The people who worked very hard on redress doing a lot of this backroom work, like going through the telephone book, there were a lot of Nisei. They worked very passionately. Of course, you know, there were many who, you know, there was a lot of, among all generations, I think there was still, there was quite a bit of conflict. But I think some of the hardest, pe hardest working people during redress were Nisei. 
but led by, you know, there were a group, there was a group of Sansei lawyers, and they, they um, had all the legal background and could push forward that way. But, you know, that sort of work that needs to get done that nobody, you know, you don't see it, right? Stuffing envelopes and things like that. The Nisei did a lot. I really think so. They were all at Joy's house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think um, on, on this note, I want to thank you for the wonderful work you, you did all those years, you continue to do. And thank Great you for winning. being here to inspire us. You are a very hard example. It's one of you to follow up because you've demonstrated how much dedication uh, and how much hard labor is involved in all this. But thank you very much for being here today. So at this point, we're going to have a little bit of a break and a reception. Um, during the reception, we have food and drinks at the back. The bathrooms are outside the library down the hall for men's and women's. Um, How soon will the reading? Yeah, and Joy would be doing a bit of uh, reading and yeah. chatting um, up here. So why don't we break for 10 minutes and come back and okay. then we'll listen to Joy and, talk a bit Yeah, more. Joy and Chuck will talk about their literary editorial work. Uh, but in the meantime, you can help yourself to the food and, and the drinks and things for us. Thank you.